All right, so let's, um, so I, I hope I, I showed you the, the key points is that um, inflation, there's a period before the hot Big Bang, uh, is the arena that sets up the initial conditions. And we can compute the initial conditions reliably because the theory is weakly coupled. So I want to show you how that works a little bit more uh, in more detail. So the first thing is just a review of uh, the sitter space because uh, inflation is not exactly the sitter space, but it gives us a lot of intuition for how to think about this era. So let me review a couple of things about the sitter space. Uh, I will only work in four dimensions, I think, in these lectures. So the sitter space is the maximally symmetric solution of Einstein's equations, a nice way of uh, thinking about the sitter space is to embed it in a higher dimensional I Minkowski mean, space. It's some sort. Of, it's a hyperboloid. Okay, and um, so it solves Einstein's equations with positive cosmological constant solutions of Einstein's equations. And uh, one way of writing this hyperboloid. So four, di four dimensional de Sitter, it's a, it's a co-dimension one surface embedded in a 5D Minkowski space. Uh, if we weak rotate the zero coordinate, it's also known as sphere, this surface. And to relate it to Hubble, the inverse radius is the Hubble rate. Okay? From the embedding coordinates, the isometry group is quite clear. It's SO1, 4 isometry group, which is good. 10 generators, 10 isometries, just like flat space. So flat space has uh, six, three rotations, three boosts, four translations. And the sitter space has uh, 10 rotations boosts. Okay. Now, if you use a specific slicing, it looks closer to how we think about um, isometries in flat space. So I'll, I'll do that. So the most convenient coordinate system for cosmology is a flat slices. So you slice the sitter with uh, some FLRW cosmology, a very special scale factor. In conformal time, it's written like this. So this doesn't foliate the entire space time, only the expanding patch. So the slices do. Something like this. It's a bit funny because the sitter has a compact, uh, compact uh, spatial slices, but this you're like trying to force the slices to be open, so you have to go all the way to infinity. I don't know if there's some interesting uh, charges, asymptotic charges story here, but anyway. So, so these are the um, the coordinates that I'm going to work with. Uh, they only cover part of the space, but it's okay. Uh, we're only interested in the expanding part because we don't really know how inflation started. And I'll show you for all practical purposes, most of the, of the physics of the density fluctuations comes from a bit later. They don't really trace all the way back to, the, to this surface here at very early times. Okay? Most of the physics is dominated by some later times here, so we think that knowing all of these, uh, uh, we can't really trace all of this geometry. Okay. Um, importantly, there is a conformal boundary. There is a, in the sense of Penrose, just like you heard for flat space. There is a conformal boundary. As 
x squares to 0. So it's strictly speaking not really part of the space time, but okay. Um, and then you can, you can see this, uh, the Penrose diagram by, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. actually it's easier to slice it with spheres. So to see them, so you can also slice the sitter space with spheres. And then you really see that the, the balls are growing in size in this direction and they are, con they are, con they are shrinking in this direction, okay? And that's uh, the interpretation of the, the sitter radius. In, in global slices, it's the radius of the neck. Okay. In particular, just a curiosity, it won't play any role for these lectures. That's why black holes in the sitter can only have certain, up to certain size, because uh, they must pass through the neck, right? So they can't be too fat. So the, the horizon must be at most of the, the sitter radius. All right. So to see the, the conformal structure in global, in global coordinates, <laughs> ds squared minus d tau squared plus r squared cosh d omega squared, um, I guess three sphere. And then you can, by some proper rescaling, I think it's like cosh tau over r is one over cosine. Yes, yes. This equals one over So this is um, this is the um, confused. Maybe there's some R squared. Okay. And so if you conformally compactify, the cosine blows up at uh, some something proportional to R, or to pi minus pi, whatever. Then uh, so then you get a Penrose diagram. It looks like a square. Okay. And the flat slices, they only cover this region here. Okay. Uh, from the point of so so from the point of view of a static observer, if you're free falling, you follow like a, a line like this, and then you're if you shoot a light ray from the beginning of your world line, you see. You can only go so far, and you can only look back into the past mm, up to a certain region. So then, so this is called the uh, causal or static patch. This will play zero role in these lectures, but I, I should mention it because this is really the challenge for the observer that lives through uh, the question of uh, someone that lives through the, the sitter era. So the, um, this person is faced with the task of understanding this region here. And actually, uh, here there might be some cool calculable example of what people call horizon complementarity, which is uh, there's the experience of someone that uh, throws him or herself into a black hole and the uh, experience of someone that just uh, bounces stuff off the black hole. and. Uh, Likewise, here in the sitter, there is the experience of someone that observes these um, late time surface here, these uh, cosmological correlators. Like us, for example, us, we are here after inflation and we observe like part of this, uh, part of this patch, if you wish, or past light cone. And um, there must be a way of relating this cosmological correlators to something, quasi-normal modes, that I don't quite know what, that this um, observer experiences. And the city is so calculable that it can probably be made precise. This is a cute uh, example of this uh, horizon complementarity. Of course, it's not the same 
as in black holes because each observer sees his or her own cosmic horizon. It's a bit different. But uh, in any case, I think that one in this conceptual direction, one can make progress here. Yeah, this is the Penrose diagram. And this is just my cartoon that inflation eventually stops. Let me erase the static parts because it won't play a role. All we really care about are these expanding slices. Then inflation eventually stops. So then you cap off this Penrose diagram and you carry on with some FRW like cosmology. And then we only observe like part of this region. That's why we observe the quantum fluctuations. Okay? So that's the picture. What is the intersection of these flat slices? Is the point or here? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a, I think it's a sphere. Yeah. I don't think it's a, yeah, we, we need to do this uh, exercise that uh, Arp was uh, described, but I think it's a, it's a sphere. It doesn't shrink to a point. Of infinite size. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they, they, it's like a, it's like a flat slice. So it's like a going to like infinite distance uh, yeah, it's like a enormous sphere infinite size um, yeah okay would we be making the same assumptions for complementarity here unitarity uh, yeah you would put you would consider for example some unitary quantum field theory in this space time and then you'd compute two sets of observables set number one are the things we're going to compute in these lectures, these cosmological correlation functions at late times. And the other set of observables is something that I don't know what the something is. Something related with this world line, the guy throwing stones and rocks into the cosmic horizon, seeing how the membrane here in the shape of the drum of uh, our cosmic horizon. And there should be a map between these two things. But it seems concrete enough that we know all sorts of things about the normals in the sitter. We know some things about perturbation theory. There should be a map between these. It would make for a beautiful project, I think. Yeah. So, um, we normally work with the flat slice in cosmology. Um, I guess mainly just to kind of draw analogies to open open flat space spirit. But I was wondering whether it's like this bit in calculations done in the global slice thing. Uh, yeah, some. Uh, some things. Um, not the like complicated three level type correlators, but I, I suspect you can do some sort of bio rescaling or, or some because uh, they have the conformal isometries. I think you can do, uh, I don't think you need to go back to the drawing board, rethink and rethink uh, the computation, new slices. You can probably do some bio transformation or something like that to get and the correlator and uh, adapt it to other coordinates. The, the, the point, it's really driven by observations, the fact that we see almost no curvature of the initial slice, only these uh, ripples of order 10 to the minus 5. And by the way, I never mentioned the numbers, right? So I'm like insisting on experiments, but AS is, I even have the number in my notes, but it's order 10 to the minus 5 squared. So when people say that the density fluctuations in the CMB, of order one in a hundred thousand, it's coming from this number here. It's really two times 10 to the minus nine, I think, something like that, which is roughly 10 to the minus 10, okay. Anyway, so, so this is where this number comes from. And, and S minus one, I'll define in a bit why the, why the heck there is this minus one, it's just historical. Uh, this number is uh, 0 0.04, so 10 to the minus two. So these two numbers are measured by experiments. Okay. Just to say that there's some observational data in these lectures. All right, so this is uh, all we really need about the geometry of the sitter space. Now, um, I wanna quantize or ju just describe the free scalar field in the sitter because uh, it will, be important free scalar okay so you you would start how would you quantize say 
same story as you're used to. Um, now we're doing quantum field theory in a curved background. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, there's a covariant there. Just to be super explicit. The equation of motion, the equation of motion, the classical one. Well, so you can uh, plug in the metric in uh, these. Um, you can plug in the metric in these uh, coordinates. Then you get a, a notice, by the way, I forgot to, sorry, I forgot to mention the so there are 10 isometries, right? So let's uh, look at it. Uh, so there are three rotations, three translations. So we're going to go to Fourier space in the spatial coordinates. There is no time translation symmetry, but there is rescaling. So eta and x to lambda eta x, the rescaling uh, cancels between upstairs and downstairs, just like scale invariance of ADS. And so these are all obvious in these coordinates. What's not obvious is that um, the surface eta going to zero gets mapped onto itself by isometries. And uh, the three other isometries that are not obvious, they act on the coordinates x as uh, uh, special conformal transformations would. Okay, So you would send x to... Um, x over x squared plus a and then you take the inverse of this inverse um, I, I hope you I hope you won't crucify me for this it's a uh, it's clear right what it means it's uh, the usual inversion plus translation so it's not obvious but it, if you study the infinitesimal version of this uh, it's an isometry of these um, of these coordinates if you put in eta going to zero. Otherwise, the, you need to shift eta and so on. There is a finite version of this transformation. But this is just the fact that at late times, the, um, this is non-trivial, right? But it's at the essence of uh, holography, at least at the level of symmetries, that there is a special surface that under the isometries is mapped onto itself. It's, it's weird, right? Usually, if you have a fixed time slice in flat space, if I time translates, I move the slice up and down. This uh, asymptotic slice here is mapped onto itself. Okay? So that's why there's a natural action of symmetries on this uh, surface, which in this case is the Euclidean conformal group. Okay, so there will be some uh, conformal symmetry playing a role in this story, but there will be a difference, uh, and I want to illustrate by looking at the free scalar. So let me... Um, I'm just going to describe the classical equation of motion. So you take sigma of x and eta, go to Fourier space, you look at a Fourier mode, sigma k of eta, and then you are going to introduce this variable. I'm introducing it so that um, if you look at the literature, it will make sense. Um, so this is a rescaling to kind of like go to... Um, canonical normalization, if you wish, to remove the redshift factor up front here in the kinetic term. So this, in the case of uh, massless particles, this V is usually called the uh, uh, Mukhanov-Sasaki variable. Okay. And uh, the resulting equation is, looks like this, VK double prime plus K squared plus So, okay, there are a couple of interesting things to, if I send eta to minus infinity, if I go to very early times, this looks like a harmonic oscillator. So what does it mean physically? Physically, if I look at, um, so, uh, you know, space-time is expanding, so the physical wavelength 
of uh, my particles being stretched. Uh, and if I go backwards in time, then it's being infinitely blue shifted. So if I go to very, very early times, it's as if it's a bunch of uh, harmonic oscillators. Okay? So then I quantize. Uh, in order to quantize the field sigma, I need to choose uh, the mode functions for creation and annihilation operators. Right? So the choice, the natural choice, is the one that matches the harmonic oscillator choice at early times. We call this thing the Bunch-Davies vacuum. Okay, there is a whole debate of if this is the right choice and blah, blah, blah. I will not say anything more about this. So I'm going to assume that we take this choice. At very early times, we quantize it as we would quantize a harmonic oscillator. Now there's something interesting. If, if you go to late times, uh, if the mass is bigger than Hubble, then this becomes very heavy, very heavy harmonic oscillator. It's heavy because the fluctuations are being diluted. It's like matter field is being diluted by the expansion of the universe. So, so it's, it's throwing away the power. So the power is being dissipated into the expansion of the universe. But if the mass is small enough, if it's small than 2 h squared, there is a competition. The universe is trying to dilute away the power by expanding, but now the field looks sort of tachyonic. So there's a competition. And uh, the cool thing is that if you send m to 0, the two effects cancel in some sense. And you end up with finite power at late times. And this is where the primordial fluctuations come from. Okay? Is that clear? How can you go to very early times without proving quantum gravity? Uh, no, we're doing quantum field theory in the Sitter space. Uh, we froze G Newton. Uh, this is the assumption that, at, okay, as I said, um, people have tried to, oh, you know, maybe you put a, you, you could, for example, reasonable thing to do is to put a cutoff. There are certain uh, wave numbers, they're getting too blue shifted, and then I'm agnostic about them. Now the question is, do they through loops back react and change cosmological observables? And... Uh, Okay, there's a whole literature about this from the early 2000s, and the conclusion seems to be that no. They would induce like vacuum polarization in the form of irrelevant operators, and it doesn't seem to change very much the predictions. So we wouldn't be able to use cosmological operations to prove quantum gravity? Uh, well, uh, I think so. Just at the free field theory level, it might be too uh, raw. But uh, if we go to higher point functions, I think there, there's something we can do. Okay, so uh, in particular, VK at late times, as eta goes to zero, VK goes like eta to some power P. Okay, just like in ADS CFT. And uh, here is what happens. The mass of the particle in Hubble units. It's kind of cute now that uh, in uh, the Sitter space, there is a notion of light and heavy, intrinsic. In flat space, there's massless and massive. There, you can talk about heavy versus light because you have an experiment. You're, you put in a scale by your ability to do experiments, but there's no intrinsic heaviness and lightness in flat space. In the theater, there is because there's the Hubble scale. And at order one, uh, this, this, this is like a, a harmonic oscillator with damping. We call Hubble friction the effect of the expansion of the universe. So when the mass is very small, there is this competition. And in fact, uh, the power uh, goes to zero, meaning that there is power at late times. Otherwise, the power P uh, is greater than zero. And then if you wait long enough, all the power is washed out. Okay. So here, uh, up to a certain point, for very light particles, power survives to late times. Uh, here, it behaves a bit like, um, what's it called? The critical damped, critical damping of a harmonic oscillator. 
while here uh, for mass slightly bigger than one it's like the over damped region in terms of representation theory the um, there are two types of representations of uh, particles one is uh, usually called the principal series if you look at E wraps of the De Sitter group. And there's another one that's called the complementary series. Uh, and we can debate about mass equals zero if it's really an E wrap or not. But anyway. Why can I go to negative? Ah, because then the norm will be. Uh, the usual issue with tachyons, the norm will be um, will not be positive definite. So if you if you look at the positive definiteness of the of the states of the ERAPs, you see that the the mass parameter stops at zero. Um, but, in, but close to zero, isn't it already effectively tachyonic? It is, it is. But uh, there is a competition between. Uh, so okay, so here it really dilutes like matter. Uh, from this point on, you start to feel the tachyonic effects, but expansion still wins, meaning that it decays, but decays slowly. And then mass equals zero, there's precise balance, so there's a finite power. So this power P for the complementary series is real and, uh, uh, and uh, goes all the way, I think, to three halves. And then from this point on, for the principal, for the principal series, uh, P will be... Um, yeah, three halves plus or minus i mu with mu real. Yeah, maybe the right thing to say is that it goes from zero to three halves. So there, yeah, one way to interpret the, um, the, the observations is to say that the inflaton the, or the particle responsible for density perturbations is not exactly massless, but it has very small mass in Hubble units, and that's why we see small tendency for power to be uh, smaller at short scales versus long scales, okay? So you can trade the spectral index by a measurement of the mass of the particle. Um, that, but, but then you're moving interpretation space. There are other ways of interpreting the, the measurement. You could say that what you're actually seeing is the dynamics of a massless field in a time-varying cosmology. You, 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 move around the blame of the index to the fact that Hubble is changing with time. We don't know what's the right interpretation yet. Oh, sorry, I think I missed it. Uh, B equals to three half plus I mu is for the complementary and the other one for the... Ah, no, no, this is the principal. Okay. And uh, this is a complementary. So does the discrete series not show up here? Uh, the discrete series um, for scalars it kind of starts at m squared uh, equals zero, and then it's tachyonic. Uh, now, whether these uh, particles are really erraps or not, uh, yeah, I don't fully understand the story myself. I, I think the claim, let's take a massless particle just to explain the, if I look at a massless particle, okay, let's go back to CFT. If you study CFT in two dimensions and you study the free scalar, you say that the free scalar doesn't exist because the two-point function of a free scalar goes like log, right? So then it's an infrared divergence. But you, but you can still talk about correlation functions of uh, exponential of phi or derivatives of phi. There's no problem if I take derivatives now, then it's fine. 1 over x minus y to a certain power. And that's how we like to think about massless fields in the sitter. May, now, a massless field in the sitter has a shift symmetry. And then the two-point function is, again, lo logarithmic. Uh, and maybe if you remove the, the zero mode from the uh, Hilbert space of the ERAP and you look at only derivatives, then it's, it's a true ERAP. But this is, uh, I, I don't claim to fully understand the story. 
The rest of the discrete series uh, is all tachyonic. But uh, you spoiled uh, the punchline in five minutes, which is that in higher spin, it does make an appearance. But maybe, uh, maybe I'll skip that for now. Um, yeah, let me uh, say one more thing about scalars before moving on, which is that for, um, for massive particles, there is a clean interpretation in terms of particles, produced particles at late times. And then uh, some of the concepts that you must have heard when talking about the Sitter space in quantum gravity become sharp. Well, for uh, um, light particles, it's, uh, it's a bit murky how to interpret the story. So let me make this point. Uh, before you go ahead, uh, three half is because of the dimension, or is like any, any Yeah, yeah, because we're in, in three plus one, yeah. It, it's, if I look at the two-point function, I square this, it uh, goes like eta to the three, and it's matter dilution, right? The, the power dilutes like the volume uh, one. It's just one over a cubed that you see in the volume of the. Okay. So it, it will be d over two in, uh, in these spatial dimensions, yeah. Okay. For, so for, uh, for uh, principal series fields for m over h bigger than one, then at late times, uh, if you pull some rescaling here, I think just just related to uh, the definition of this variable. Question. So uh, why is it greater than one? Shouldn't it be greater than square root two? Yeah, yeah. It's it. I, I'm being I'm being impressionistic. It's uh, um, delta delta minus three equals minus m squared over h squared, and then uh, so I guess the moment that. Uh, m squared over h squared is, I think, nine quarters. Then uh, this goes into the complex plane, okay. and then yeah. So sorry, it's uh, it's it's three halves. But uh, yeah, uh, because I'm making twiddle uh, equations, uh, I can, I'm making a twiddle error here. <laughs> it's not it's not precise. Yeah. Okay. Strictly speaking, if you really want to compute p. I'll write the formula here. P times P minus 3 equals minus M squared over H squared. Contrast that with ADS CFT. In ADS CFT, you would have delta delta minus D plus M squared R ADS squared. So if you just weak rotate the ADS radius, then you get the formula for the, um, for the power. And then I'm just keeping the 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 leading power at late times so in cosmology we call this the growing mode the growing the, and the decaying mode in yeah maybe another comment in ads cft um usually uh you control sources right so you like hammer ads and then you measure a response and then you so therefore you well there are exceptions but typically you 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 look at Specific value of delta, even though there are two solutions. One is the source, and the other is the response. And the response is the one that uh, really has an interpretation as an operator primary in the CFG. Here in cosmology, we control the state at the beginning of the universe. And at late times, we have both. We have an admixture of uh, eta p plus plus eta p minus. It's just that we keep the one that decays the slowest, and we call it the growing mode. So that's just notation. For the case of m over h bigger than, uh, I think, 3 halves, then uh, if you strip out some overall power up front, then it looks like this. Eta. Again, this m over h is really square root of m squared over h squared minus something. Uh, C1 plus C1 tilde. So there's some relative coefficients here because you impose that at very early times. So this is at very late times. And then at very early times, as eta goes to minus infinity, the quantization condition, if you wish, was that it, it looked like a harmonic oscillator, e to the i k eta, okay? 
uh, first of all, it kind of gets rid of k dependencies just because everything is stretched so much that you don't care about the, the wavelength of the particle anymore. But now, uh, look at conformal time. And uh, if, you, if you recall, So conformal time is roughly e to the minus ht, right? Um, so if you put it back here, what is this? Um, it's like c1 e to the i m t Aha. Uh -huh. So we started with single particle. Uh, at early times, and at late times, we get an admixture of positive and negative frequency. So this is particle production. Okay? Typical feature of time-dependent uh, setups. So a way to think about it is that the time dependence of the cosmology is like a source. Energy is not conserved. So if you look at late times, you see a state populated by particles. Now this interpretation becomes hard uh, for light states because you only see the growing mode. You see some sort of condensate. But for particles of mass greater than Hubble, it, uh, it makes sense, this interpretation. And in fact, you can, e you can even compute uh, the, the, if you wish, the, the ratio between these coefficients. It's related to some Bogolyubov coefficients. And you can find that the Bogolyubov coefficients, beta, beta squared, which roughly speaking, roughly speaking, is controlled by C1 tilde over C1, uh, is given by form looks like this. So it looks like a Bose distribution at the temperature H over 2 pi. So for a, for a particle of a Compton wavelength smaller than the De Sitter radius, then there's this interesting interpretation of the, the Sitter horizon as some hot box at temperature h over 2 pi. And then you see this reflected in the super horizon uh, at the late time limits uh, of this uh, these, uh, classical mode function. In the case of light particles, it's not so clear because the Compton wavelength is bigger than the size of the horizon. So it's like, how do you heat up some object that is bigger than the size of the box? Yeah, so that's. Uh, so we were doing a flat slicing, right? Not static parts. So in what sense is there a good notion of horizon? Uh, no, there isn't. There isn't. I'm just saying that uh, the fact that, that there is this uh, temperature is not surprising from the point of view of the static observer. And you're seeing the avatar of this temperature in this uh, particle production rate. But, yeah. The static observer calls integral curves of. Uh, the static observer, we need to go to static coordinates. So there's a different, um, uh, there, there's a different, um, yeah, so in static coordinates, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, minus, uh, I think. Uh -huh. Now you're going to, maybe the other way around. Now I'm confused if it's, uh, now I'm confused if it's, uh, well, it's uh, power P and this is power P and now P is plus or minus one, I forget which one uh, and uh, but in this coordinates uh, time translation is an isometry right what actually what happens here is interesting this is a digression but okay so these coordinates only cover uh, this patch and now you have time translation so you're like aha I'm going to write the energy and minimize the energy and you will find that the energy is positive uh, uh, definite um, but only if you uh, restrict yourself to this region here. If you try any slicing in which uh, 
this is an isometry that kind of matches the, the static coordinates. But then the slicing goes beyond the horizon, then you find that the energy flips sign. Namely, the, the, the gap closes. Even if the particle is massive, the mass gap closes here at the cosmic horizon. That's why you have particle production. That's why there's no good notion of vacuum, because there's no energy that you can minimize. So it's always a bit tricky how you define uh, the vacuum state. Okay. So this behavior at eta goes to minus infinity, is that what you meant when you said that the bunch theory is yeah. boundary Yeah. Yeah. You could have picked, uh, you could have picked, um, uh, it's called alpha vacuo, right? So you could have picked alpha plus alpha bar, 1 over root 2 k e to the minus i k eta. And you, it's a feature of the sitter space that you end up with a decidering variant two-point function. Uh, in uh, the case of a harmonic oscillator, there is a positive definite Hamiltonian for which the minimum value is the one that comes from the choice where you throw this guy away. Right? And you just keep this guy. But we don't have this. So we just uh, follow our nose and, and do what uh, happens in flat space. Yeah. To what extent is this uh, probability transformation a, con a consequence of the expansion amount of just simply changing variables from eta to t? If we change variables at eta to minus infinity, would we not also get? Ah, uh, you mean uh, can't I ch generate this other guy here? Yeah, but by no, no, no. It, it will really change the physical correlation functions at late times. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, in fact, this, this, uh, yeah, this. If you if you quantize with, so it really changes what you mean by creation annihilation operator, right? Because. Uh, what will go in front of the annihilation operator is not going to be this. It will be an admixture of positive and negative frequency. If you try to do a perturbation theory now, say you want to do the I-epsilon prescription to compute some, uh, some uh, perturbative object. Usually the I-epsilon prescription damps integrals, uh, time integrals, right? And now I'll have positive and negative frequencies. I can't damp both of them. So that, uh, that will actually generate a singularity. So correlators that come from these uh, the sitter invariant states, they are consistent with the isometries, but they are singular. They are singular at physical momenta. So they have a very clean um, observational signature. So it's a working assumption that this is the vacuum. And when we get to uh, correlators beyond two points, I will I'll mention uh, how you can relax this assumption and what happens then. And this doesn't take place for uh, m smaller than h? Or why is this higher than greater than h? No, no, no. For m greater than h, then the interpretation in terms of particles is clear. This is true for any mass. Notice that there's no mass here. Remember, if you look at the formula here, if I send eta to minus infinity, this term, I don't care. It's a harmonic oscillator for any mass. The influence of the mass is important at late times because it, it will enhance this term here, either tachyonic or non-tachyonic. So I'm just saying that if the mass is bigger than Hubble, then uh, you can't just throw away. Both modes are equally decaying. So you keep both. There will be a relative phase between them. Then the particle interpretation will be, uh, will be clear. OK. Any more questions? Yeah. So uh, to what extent can you then generalize this beyond just uh, scalar fields in a fixed geometry? Like if I have quantum gravity, then eta goes to minus infinity precisely the region where we don't really know what's happening. How would we, what sort of boundary conditions would we impose in? In perturbation theory, you can, uh, you can carry on. Beyond perturbation theory, I have no idea. Yeah. It's a fair point. The, the only thing that we know how to do are really uh, perturbative computations in this business. So we're just doing either quantum field theory in a fixed background or uh, treat uh, things in Newton perturbatively. And even there, there, there are claims that if you go beyond the leading three level approximation, there are already physical effects that you can't uh, control. Uh, okay. Regarding what? Regarding scaling dimension ADS. Ah, 
It's just that to go from this formula to this formula, you send h to i, r a d s. And, and this is why for m squared positive in this case, you get these deltas that are consistent with unitarity of a CFT, uh, real dimension and so on. Now, because of this minus sign, if the mass is big enough, you go into complex values of, uh, so in ADS, there is no such thing as, uh, so in ADS, you would send the, the RG coordinate, if you wish, the Z coordinate to zero, and you would only see power loss, like Z to a certain power. And here you're seeing complex powers, but it is very natural in the sitter space. But it's clear distinction between DS and ADS. Okay. Now, two-point function. So the two-point function uh, is not very hard. It's just a mod square of the classical mode function. We're just quantizing the, the free field. Say that again? The eta going to minus infinity. It's the beginning of inflation. If you. So, so if I'm in flat slicing, here's the Penrose diagram. This is eta going to minus infinity. And then this eta goes to zero. But, but uh, let me make a comment about that. If I compute out the two-point function in this bunch Davis vacuum, let me call it zero, the vacuum. If I compute like sigma k of eta, sigma k prime of eta, or minus k at equal times. Okay, I just compute the two-point correlation function. There will be a delta function of translation invariance, and um, I think. I'm, now I'm just talking about um, uh, yes, I'm confused. Da, 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 da. Let me talk about these um, these uh, canonically normalized fields just to make this uh, this point v k v k prime one plus one over k eta squared. Mm -hmm. Guess there's no h here. Let me. Okay. Now, um, if eta goes to minus infinity, this is a very small correction. Well, minus infinity is literally nothing. But if eta, uh, if inflation starts later, not at eta minus infinity then uh, this is a small correction, if you wish. You can reabsorb it. And uh, yeah, you, if you put some number up front here, some coupling constant up front, or something that controls the size of the two-point function, you'd say there's a very mild uh, scale dependence induced by this. So there is a, I mean, in interaction theory, more or less persists, and people call it the sitter no hair theorem. The, the, it's the sense that, if I modify the initial states, if I don't go all the way to eta minus infinity, I go to some finite eta, and I sprinkle in some particles in the free theory Fox uh, space, I'll change the initial states, but if I wait long enough, the particles power is red shifted away, and the correlation function is asymptote to the vacuum correlation functions. Okay. It's the type of theorem that still lacks like a um, very nice, uh, clean, um, derivation. There are lots of derivations, which means that there is no really satisfying one on the market. But that's uh, one simple avatar of it. Is that for all masses? This is for mass. Let's see. Uh, the, the, the point persists. Uh, the, here, uh, there will be some hypergeometric functions. But, uh, in any case, the, this is at finite time. So the point is that at late times, uh, then it goes to a constant. Well, in this case, it's blowing up, right? But uh, it's because of the canonical normalization. Okay, so as, as eta goes to zero, the sigma 
two-point function goes to a constant. The constant is really uh, h squared over 2k cubed. The 2k cubed is uh, the scale invariance for you. Okay. If you Fourier transform in three dimensions, d3k over k cubed, uh, there's no scale, so you get the log. So that's where the scale invariance is coming from. The, the, here there's a k, but uh, uh, da, 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 da. maybe I made a mistake. Ah, no, there is a k squared here. Okay, it's, it's uh, yeah. So if you plug back in the, the value of sigma, sigma is a h eta v. Now as I send eta to zero, this, this dominates. But then uh, the eta from the definition there cancels out and you get uh, uh, 1 over k cubed. Okay. So this is uh, where the, the scale invariant two-point function is coming from. All right. How much time do I have? Okay, let me try to do it. So what happens in inflation? So everything I did here was free scalar in the sitter. Uh, and then I, I just recap this tomorrow before we, get, we carry on. So inflation, how does the story change? Actually, the story is technically much more complicated, but then when the dust settles, it's again the free scalar in the sitter, more or less. So that's why I spent so much time. So let me um, describe a very minimal model of inflation. Very minimal model of inflation is just Einstein gravity and a scalar field. So now there are three degrees of freedom, the scalar and the graviton. And we would like to quantize these two degrees of freedom. We would like to quantize these two degrees of freedom. I can't do justice to this computation in five minutes. So I'll just tell you what happens, and then tomorrow I'll show you how it works. So there are, the degrees of freedom are the metric gamma and uh, the 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 field that gives rise to the density fluctuations uh, let me call it clock and I'll explain to you what it means so or maybe density no uh, no, gamma is the gamma is the metric on a three. Uh, okay. The background geometry is uh, phi is going to have a vacuum expectation value. If you wish, is going to have some classical solution, and um, the metric is going to be some FLRW metric. And then you must solve uh, for the equations of motion, OK, of this background. So now I have uh, Einstein's equations and the equation of motion of the scalar field. It will imply some dynamical solution for the scalar phi and some dynamical solution for the scale factor A. In order for inflation to happen, this scale factor must be close enough to the sitter space. And then I need to define to you what I mean by close enough. And uh, so um, then A is close enough. And I'll do that tomorrow to the sitter. So there will be deviations from the sitter. They are small. They're called low row parameters. And I'll define what, uh, what they are, okay? meaning that A dot over A, which is Hubble, is approximately constant. So of course, this is a 
equation doesn't make sense, approximately constant, but uh, I'll, I'll describe to you what I mean in dimensionless uh, language. Now the degrees of freedom are uh, beyond the background, so I need to quantize. I need to look at fluctuations. Remember, we're trying to find the small ripples on top of this background geometry. And uh, then comes the definition. So for the fluctuations, there are two gauges. One possibility is uh, you, talk, you talk about the, the metric fluctuation and the fluctuation of the scalar field. Um, this is nice, but it's not uh, close uh, to the density perturbations. Okay? So this is possibility number one. There's another gauge choice, another gauge choice that's better. That, and uh, let me call it gamma children, gamma zeta, in which you set, uh, you, you, if you wish, you eat the scalar fluctuations, like the Higgs mechanism. So you eat the scalar fluctuation, and then there is a scalar degree of freedom in gravity. Okay? So this is a local modification of the scale factor of the universe. So the, Don't worry, I'll do this tomorrow. I'm just, uh, I just want to make you happy before we leave. Um, uh, this is the definition. Um, if I write the metric in 3 plus 1 splitting, So this is a nice way of uh, writing down the metric. It, uh, it, so this is the metric on the three slice. So there will be three slices, the foliate space time. And then these are clocks and rods that tell me how points on the different slices are related to each other. Uh, the, the nice thing about these guys is that they have no dynamics. It's like a, a naught in quantum electrodynamics. It doesn't have kinetic term. So if I write the metric in this form, these are Lagrangian multipliers. You can integrate them out. So the physical degrees of freedom are inside of this metric on the three slice. Okay. So from the point of view of the metric on the three slice, let me move here. From the point of view of the metric on the three slice, I have the following. Um, Bear with me, we're almost there. Two minutes, no finish. Then you'll see that our effort will pay off. Um, Hij, what is the background? A square of T delta Ij, what I just described. I need to describe to you what A of T is, but we'll do that tomorrow. It's quasi the sitter. Let me put the sitter in quotes. Uh, then there will be fluctuations. So the first fluctuation will be a fluctuation in the scale factor itself, but it's a function of uh, uh, space and time. So this is the zeta fluctuations uh, related to the local change of the volume. In fact, if you compute the Ricci scalar in linear uh, into the linear order, it's uh, the Laplacian of this field zeta plus uh, a squared t gamma ij with uh, gamma ii tra transverse traceless. So it's a 3 by 3 matrix with uh, 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 four conditions on it. It's two, de two degrees of freedom. So this is the graviton. Okay. So now this is your task. It's not trivial. Uh, now it looks simple, but it actually, it's kind of a pain in the ass. You, you take that, that action, you plug in um, the metric in this form in terms of Hij and I and N. Then N and Ni have no dynamics. You must solve for its equations of motion. They're called constraint equations. They're the Gauss law for GR. And, and you solve for the Gauss law in terms of this variable zeta, gamma, 
and the background stuff. Then you plug it back in and expand to quadratic order. It, after a good couple hours of work, you end up with um, the facts that um, it's the action for two free fields, more or less. Okay. So the scalar field, yeah, let me not write the action because uh, then I need to define stuff. So you end up with the action for two scalar fields, more or less. So each polarization mode of the graviton behaves more or less like a massless scalar in the sitter. And the scalar fluctuation also behaves like a massless scalar in the sitter. So why don't we see gravitons? It's because uh, the, they're canonically normalized with different coefficients. So their two-point functions will have a hierarchy between them, which is controlled by the fact that it's close enough to the sitter. That's why I don't want to write it. I need to define what I mean by close enough. So tomorrow I'll show you that when the dust settles, I end up with uh, two actions for a free scalar in quasi the sitter with slightly different canonical normalizations. And that's why I get different two-point correlation functions for gravitons and scalars. Okay. Then after that, we can set up the problem of going beyond the two-point approximation. Sorry, if we're going over time, so I'll stop here. Uh, so the scalar degree of freedom, uh, so you decide to foliate space-time in such a way that the scalar field has no uh, dynamics. So then it gets eaten, just like in the Higgs mechanism, it gets eaten into the metric. So this is a dynamical degree of freedom. So it will appear in the, so the solution of the constraint equations, N and Ni, will depend, in fact, to linear order in perturbation theory, it doesn't depend on gamma, it only depends on zeta. So the fact that zeta is non-zero, is why and i and n are non-zero or non-trivial. This, uh, this is what? Yeah. Well, it's called the bond salopec uh, variable. Yeah, but the model center reviews it nicely. Uh, yes. uh, the, the, but the, the, there's still time dependence in H I J. The, the, the time dependence now in gamma J and J. Yeah. So gamma J and zeta are functions of space and time. Yeah, yeah. So they're quantum fields. So they will have. We're, we're only interested in the late time, equal time correlation functions, but they will have time dependence. So just, they'll be just like a massless scalar in the sitter space with different coefficients in front of the action. So you'll, you'll follow the same discussion we had of the free field in the sitter space. Uh, here I just wrote, uh, because we're interested only in quadratic fluctuations, so I just wrote uh, the linear order um, expansion of the metric. But then we'll go beyond. Well, then we'll forget this. We'll try to get rid of this formalism. But uh, yeah. Great. If there's no more questions, then I suggest we pass on to the biscuits. Sounds good. We can be a for anyway, no? Yes, half past one.